Hello, everybody. Hello. Good morning. Welcome to worship. So good to see you all. I feel like I haven't seen you in two weeks. It's good to see you all. Let's begin today with our call to worship, which this week is adapted from Psalm 95. <laughs> Let us bow down and worship. He is our God. Let us pray. Lord God, you love us and you call us to love you. You show us great compassion and patience. Yet we fail to have compassion and patience with those struggling and in great need. We see them as less than us. We see them as obstacles in our way. We see them as drains on our resources. We fail to recognize our shared need for grace in every day, every hour, and every minute. Forgive us for our pride, self-centeredness, and ability to see things as they really are. Renew and restore us as followers of Jesus Christ who are saved by grace and live each day by grace. Through Christ we pray. Amen. What do we got for announcements for us today? October mission, campus missions are our first week. This is money that will be divided uh, among, uh, between two ministries. One is Queen Anita, uh, Christian Fellowship up at Clarion University or was it Northwest Pennsylvania University in Clarion, whatever it's called now. That's where it is. Uh, it's an ongoing ministry they have there to students on campus. It's a fellowship group for Christian students who are on that campus. And if you've been to our secular uh, campuses recently, you know how important that is to have that light there. So that goes to support them, but it also, part of it goes to the Believers in Christ Club or the BIC Club at Corn City High School, uh, which is a prayer and Bible club that meets there regularly. Let's see what else. Um, <clears throat> you got to hear from Kayla last week, huh? I, I hear that she, she had uh, some interesting things to tell you. I'm, I'm, I wish I was there to hear some of it. But you, you, you got the full spectrum of everything they're doing, uh, didn't you? So, so I'm grateful that she was able to come and, and talk to us about that. So when we give to that, uh, we consider it a mission. As you probably figured out, it's not a Christian organization, uh, but it is an organization we support as Christians. So now you know a little bit more about it. Uh, this week, Bible study, 10 a.m. We're talking about, I don't know what. I was on vacation last week, so give me a break here, folks. But this, this, this Thursday, 10 a.m. Bible study. Uh, and don't forget, we are collecting full-size candy bars for trick-or-treat, which I just found out this morning is indeed on Thursday, October 31st, starting at 5.30 here in town. Uh, so uh, that's what we got coming up. Anything that I, that I missed? Thank, thank the people for coming and, and decorating the sanctuary this week. It looks, it looks wonderful. It's always good to see. Come and be festive. Let us pray. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for today. We thank you for the sunshine. Uh, we remember it's October, God. We're usually cold, and we were cool this morning, but we look forward to the warmth of the afternoon, God, and, and just we see the leaves falling on the ground, and, and we, we see how you, you change seasons, God, and we're just reminded how awesome this world is that you created. You created for us to live in. You created for us to tend, uh, created to be a home uh, for, for us as, as, I guess, the pinnacle of your creation, God, uh, not by anything we've done, but because we are created in your image. And so we do thank you for all of that. We thank you for providing for us and giving us uh, peace in, in our time. And we, we thank you for uh, giving us everything we need, God. Most of us have more than we need. and It's all provided uh, one way or the other from your hand. And we say thank you uh, for this extra grace that you always give us. God, most of all, we give you thanks for your son, Jesus Christ. While we were still sinners, he died for us. Let us never forget that, God. Let us never forget to be grateful. Let us never forget to live according to that. Uh, when the world assails us, sends horrible things at us, when we are troubled, when we are downcast, when we are depressed, when we are saddened by the events that, that beset us in this world, let us turn with joy and remember your son, Jesus Christ, and what he has done to prove his love for us. Let us always know that no matter what, let us understand more fully how much you love us in every single moment, Father. Let that be what calls us out of sin, God, as we repent and we turn from it 
uh, because we love you. We are so grateful for what you have done for us. God, help us to live lives according to the grace that you have shown us, according to uh, the position you have already put us in as saved uh, saints, followers of Jesus Christ. God, let that be what drives your church. Let us never forget that you call us to live lives that are changed, to live lives that are not focused on ourselves, but are focused on you and therefore focused on others as we love you most and we love others more than ourselves. God, uh, we, we pray that you help us to open our eyes to see the needs around us. Help us see them, God, and help us respond because so often it's just, we, we get into our own selfish malaise. Forgive us and move us to be your servants, that, that we would perform your acts of kindness, your acts of love and grace and mercy in the world, starting with the people around us, and that they would see your love in action. And God, as we do this, uh, that you would make us bold to proclaim the words of your gospel uh, in quiet, gentle conversations with friends and in other places. Uh, l- let us speak the words of your truth that they might hear and believe unto eternal life by the power of your Holy Spirit, God. God, we pray for your church, the church of Jesus Christ, starting with East Brady Baptist Church and our congregations in East Brady and the surrounding communities, that you would make us strong, that you would uh, help us to have a deeper, more effective faith. Uh, Help us, God, to seek you more and love you more. And, And again, so that drives us to love others but draw us to repentance, every single one of us. Let us uh, seek your word as, as our guiding light, Father, the things that guide us, the principles that, that we set our lives around. God, help us to crowd out all other voices, all other ideologies, but just let us look to your word and form our life accordingly and expect from others according to your word, Father. God, we, we, we pray that uh, you send your revival to the nation of the United States, that this would be truly uh, one nation under God, not that it would be just something we, we, we print and we say, and, you know, in God we trust, but that it would be true, and that we as a nation would be a light to you. God, we, uh, we recognize we can't force others around us to live for you and to proclaim you. And so we call that you send your Holy Spirit upon us, first to your church and then others, a uh, spirit of repentance that we turn from our ways and seek you and that others more and more would come to faith in you and we would lift you up and hold you up in, in high esteem, Father. We do pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ who serve you in places where it's dangerous for them. And there are a lot of violent places right now, God. Oh, we pray that you keep them safe, help them to overcome, help them to persevere, help, help them to remain faithful in you. God, we, we pray for their persecutors that they would see the faith of those they are persecuting, they too would be convicted by that and they would seek to follow after you. God, we pray. We pray for uh, places where there is violence. We remember particularly Ukraine. Israel just seems like even this week still, years later, you know, an escalation of things or things going on there, Father. We pray for peace. We pray that you work in the hearts of those who are in places to make it happen. Uh, That you've, you've put them there, Father. So draw them to you that they might bring your peace to this world. Uh, we, we pray that where there is hatred and anger and rage, that your spirit would work in those hearts and, and that would be taken away and that you would create a safe world for all of us, God, if we would just follow you. God, we, we pray for our United States as we, we are in this election season. We are so grateful uh, that there was no violence yesterday at this rally that's so near our house. Um, um, but we pray uh, that you continue to help Americans to be calm, to be patient. God, we know not everyone in this nation follows you. So many don't follow you. So help us as your people to set the example of love and grace, even as we disagree with so many. God, we pray that it would go forth peacefully. Uh, we, we, we pray uh, that it would go forth in truth, this election, and beyond. God, will we pray all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we're back in the book of Acts, chapter 19, starting at verse 11. You see, this threw you off because it was Ephesians, didn't it? Yeah. No, we're in Acts, chapter 19, starting at verse 11. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him 
were taken to the sick, and their illnesses were cured, and the evil spirits left them. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, In the name of the Jesus whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Siva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I know about, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. Well, I think it is fitting that as we make our way through the book of Acts, we come to this passage right now, right today, the first Sunday of this month, which in our society is often thought of as spooky season. Have you heard people refer to it as spooky season? And I mean, it's fun sometimes to be spooked a little, to be scared a little bit in a safe, contained way. You know, this is the month in our culture where we kind of indulge in that. The season kind of beckons us into that. Uh, unfortunately, the season also beckons people further into celebrating practices associated with the forces of evil and darkness in this world. It's a celebration that has led to the acceptance of these practices so that they, they are in society in an ongoing way, in a way that they have become mainstream. For instance, there are now several Witches shops in Butler area now. Uh, I mean, they're not secret. They're out there opening, they're advertising, they're part of uh, the local economy. And just uh, about a month ago, I saw this post on Facebook promoting the availability of divination readings at a home right here in East Brady. These sorts of practices have long been recognized for their associating with evil going back to, oh, the days before the people of Israel entered the promised land, or probably before that. But at that point, through Moses, God warned the people about such practices. And he tells them in Deuteronomy chapter 18, that no one be found among you who sacrifices their son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft, or casts spells, or who is a medium or a spiritist who consults the dead. It's quite a list, isn't it? But it's a clear message from God warning us against participating in or celebrating these types of activities. And for that reason, every year, we get together with our Ignite Community Youth Group. We invite them over for a bonfire in my parents' cemetery. Yes, you heard that correctly. My parents now own the land that once belonged to Kaler Berean Baptist Church, which for a while was the sister church of, of this one. I actually had a photo. I was showing some people uh, uh, back earlier of that. Uh, but with that property came a cemetery. So my parents are the proud owners of a cemetery, which I was just up kind of tending a little bit uh, yesterday. It's a perfect place during spooky season to get with the youth around a fire uh, to warn them against participation in any activities that, that have to do with these demonic practices. God clearly tells us to have nothing to do with these practices. That's why I used to love the haunted mine uh, in Toronto. You'd go there and they'd just like have all these spooky things and these scary things. It's kind of a fun way to be spooked. And one time we even took uh, uh, some of us younger people from the church went as a group, as a church thing, until that one time. I got there and one of the spaces they were depicting uh, uh, Satan worship. And I said, not again, never again, because God tells you have nothing to do with these things. Nonetheless, they have become mainstream in our society and be part because of the popularity of these things that we do this time of year to, to celebrate and celebrating this time of year. So many people welcome these sorts of practices into their life. They may not even be aware that they are doing it, but the festival celebration of the season in our culture beckons them to it. 
And so it's fitting that today we come to this passage in Acts chapter 19 that really sets a a real life cautionary tale about the dangers of getting involved in these sorts of activities. Acts chapter 19 finds the Apostle Paul in Ephesus as he continues his missionary journey. He's kind of shed Timothy and Silas a couple towns back, left them there to you know, tend to the church there. Now it's just Paul. And some things happened in his ministry in Ephesus that Luke tells us about. Notably, for three months, Paul reasons with uh, the, the Jews every week in their Jewish synagogue. But when the majority of the Jewish people reject the message of Jesus Christ, Paul then takes the minority who had come to believe and follow Jesus, and he goes and he starts preaching the gospel in a secular lecture hall. It's kind of amazing. But once more, we see Paul being rejected by his own people, and so then taking the gospel to the Gentiles. And then one more interesting thing happens when he's in Ephesus. God does miracles through Paul. Now, we've seen this happen before with Paul and some of the other apostles in the book of Acts. God does miraculous things through them to kind of authenticate their message, the idea being that God worked through these apostles in miraculous ways so the people then could know that God approved of their message about Jesus because why would God empower them to do uh, uh, great things if they were lying about God and about Jesus? So it was kind of a way of authenticating their message. The curious thing is that God does miracles in Ephesus even through Paul's handkerchiefs, which is kind of gross when you think about it, right? It's like, oh, he, oh Paul, quick sneeze in this. This guy over here has a cold. We need to heal him. And, you know, it's kind of gross. I don't know if that's how it worked or not. But, you know, Luke tells us two things happened when, when the sick were touched by one of Paul's used handkerchiefs. One, they were cured of their illnesses. And two, evil spirits left them. Exorcism. And oh, that second one, that catches our attention, doesn't it? That's one that we pay attention to because people today, we're just fascinated with the powers within the spiritual realm and how we can contact them and how we can get control over them, really. That's why every one or two or three years at the most, there is a new hit exorcism movie. So people are just fascinated by the topic now. Well, they were in first century Ephesus too, especially some Jews who were known to go around driving out evil spirits. Uh, these Jews were the seven sons of Siva, which is kind of fun to say, right? Seven sons of Siva. Siva, Luke tells us, was a Jewish chief priest. Uh, was he really? Or was this just kind of an honorary self-proclaimed title? And if he was, or if he wasn't, why was he? Or at least the seven sons, what were they doing in Ephesus? We don't know any of that. What we do know is that in the first century, some of the Jewish chief priests did dabble in driving out evil spirits. Even Jesus kind of mentions this during his ministry. They did this through sorcery, even though, as we've already seen, such activity was expressly forbidden by God in the law given through Moses. But even so, some Jews persisted in it, and Jewish sorcerers, they were highly esteemed. And in fact, there was a certain prestige given in magic circles to to Jews who could do this, particularly those who were connected to the priesthood. Oh, because as priests, they would be taught, they would have training in proper ways to pronounce names and words associated with God and in magical circles. That's where all the power is, folks. Properly pronouncing words and names. Excuse me. Particularly those associated with God. was supposedly the way to release the inherent power in that. You just say the right name and you say it right. Power to control things. Power to bind spirits. Well, so in Ephesus, this Paul fellow comes along and he starts doing all these amazing things in the name of Jesus. And apparently these seven sons of Siva, they think, ha, he's revealed to us this new powerful name, a name that all spirits melt away from. And now we know it. Paul's given away the secret. Secret magic. So, so these seven sons of Siva, they go... And they they try to use the name of Jesus over those among them who are known to be demon-possessed. At one point, they encounter a demon-possessed man, and they declare, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Notice that these seven sons of Siva, 
Do not take any ownership of any sort of any sort of faith or belief in Jesus. They don't say in the name of our Lord or even in the name of the Lord. It's just like in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. If anything, they're the kind of trying to, to, to invoke Paul or some power Paul might have. They think that the power to command evil spirits is merely in saying the name Jesus. As if Jesus' name is quite literally a magic word. You remember when you were little? You were told, say the magic word, please. You get what you want. And it was like here they kind of think, hey, say the magic word Jesus and these demons will give you what you want. <clears throat> but that's not what happened at all here, is it? I mean, what happened is, first, rather than obeying them, the demons argue back to them, which people, this is something you never want. You never want to hear a demon speak back to you. You know, some people think, oh, would that be neat? No. You know, we're just a small congregation here, and there aren't many of us, right? But there are multiple people here who can tell you real life stories about demons speaking back to people, and it's outright terrifying. You don't ever want to experience this. But the demon says to them, Jesus I know, and Paul I know about, but who are you? I mean, the literal translation from the original language is, Jesus I recognize, and Paul am I acquainted with, but who are you? He's like he's saying, Jesus I know through direct interaction and experience. That's what the word means. Uh, all the demons know Jesus in this way. They actually know him through direct experience because Jesus is the son of God. He's their master too. They don't like it, but he is. They know him. Paul, I understand. I've heard of him. I know what he's about. I know enough to know I should probably stay away from him. But you? Oh, you're nothing to me. Uh, the demon's pretty much saying to them, who are you to tell me what to do? And then the demon-possessed man attacks them. The demons go after them, which again, it, it's utterly terrifying when you think about it. They had sought out and through their own actions released this demon into their midst. And now when it attacks them, they've got no way to stop it. <laughs> and it seems to me they get off easy, being just overpowered and beaten so that they run from the house naked and bleeding. And they're so terrified that it's everything in them and just this scramble and scurry to get away, fleeing for their lives so desperately that they don't even care now that they're running down the streets naked as they're bleeding. They just want to get out of there. And I would say this is a relatively mild encounter with a demon. You start to see why God tells us so clearly not to have anything to do with this sort of business. We live in a world where these evil spiritual forces are real and active. I, I know it's easy to kind of convince ourselves, oh, that's not real. We, we hear the reports, we hear the stories and encounters, and we convince ourselves, oh, that's made up. Or they just imagine that. Uh, and some of it is. And so we dismiss all of it. And we say, I don't believe in that stuff. But sometimes it's very real. I mean, it's recorded in the Bible, God's word to us. You know, those times Jesus encounters demons in the Gospels, and even in this, this account with Paul, it's all very real. We live in a world where these spiritual forces of darkness are active, and they mean us harm when we encounter them. So how do we respond to that? That's the question, isn't it? If we, we, we actually acknowledge this is real. Some people respond by living in fear because, hey, these, these things are very scary. But God tells us in 1 John 4, 18, that perfect love drives out fear, or casts out fear, and Jesus loves us perfectly. So we don't have to live in fear. God's desire is not that we live in fear of these things every day. That's one of the reasons he gave us Jesus, so we wouldn't have to be, be afraid of them. It's just one more reason to thank God for giving us Jesus, because he gives us Jesus every day as we live in a world where these things are. So how then do we respond? I, I think a good place is to start by looking at how the people in Ephesus responded when these things started happening among them. Luke tells us, in Acts chapter 19, verse 17, when this became known to the Jews and the Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear. And the name of Jesus was held in high honor. The name of Jesus is held in high honor by both the Jews and the Greeks. 
Notice where they directed their attention when scary things started happening. The name of the Lord Jesus was held high honor. They turned their attention to Jesus and they honored Jesus. They didn't keep focusing on the forces of darkness. They stopped taking Jesus lightly and they stopped trying to use his name as a mere magic word, a play thing. And instead they recognized the authority and power of Christ. They looked to Jesus and they took him seriously. In discussing our battle against evil forces, the Apostle John tells us in his first letter to the churches, you dear children are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. You're protected from evil. You've overcome it by the power of the one who is in you. The one who is in you is greater than the evil forces in the world. The one who is in you is the Holy Spirit of Christ. But we know we receive the Holy Spirit only when we truly put our faith in Jesus, when we have truly repented and believed. You receive the Holy Spirit and his protection when you decide to be done treating Jesus as a part-time thing. You decide to stop treating him as something you acknowledge when it's convenient or helpful. But instead, you hold Jesus in high honor like they did in Ephesus. You submit to him and you live for him, thus taking upon yourself the new life that he purchased for you on the cross. See, those who hold Jesus in high honor in this way will overcome the evil in this world. There are a lot of people in this world refuse the Holy Spirit and his protection over their life because they refuse to submit to Jesus. They refuse to repent. They refuse to hold Christ in high honor. Those who do have overcome the evil forces of this world by the power of Christ, Holy Spirit living in them. He is the seal of protection. So, if you encounter evil forces, have nothing to do with them. Don't engage them in any way. Don't respond to them. Don't open up a dialogue. Don't uh, in any way indicate any interest. You just keep holding Jesus in high honor. He's the one you keep looking to. Pray to God through Christ that you in whatever situation you are experiencing would be made safe and redeemed by the power of Christ. I kid you not, as I was writing this, which was a while back, uh, I received a text uh, from someone asking me to pray for a loved one who felt at that moment like there was evil all around them. And the person who sent that text did right. They didn't try to engage the evil, but they instead prayed in the name of Jesus and they solicited the prayers of others to pray in the name of Jesus. Don't look at the evil. Look at Jesus. See, like the people in Ephesus, you just keep your eyes on Jesus and you look to him alone for deliverance and salvation. Just keep holding Jesus in high honor. Luke continues by telling us in, in verse 18, many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. They're confessing what they had done. What did they done? Well, the context makes it clear that what they were confessing was participating in or practicing sorcery. They repent. They turn from it. And they confess it. They confess it publicly. They turn their backs on it. And so they can publicly receive the grace that comes from Christ when we repent and confess. That's what they did in Ephesus. How do we respond when we encounter demonic forces? The same way. See, we too need to confess when we even dabble in sorcery or witchcraft because so many in the church have in one way or another, perhaps unknowingly, but we've done this by using a Ouija board. That's talking to demons. There are people here who can tell you stories. By reading and sharing horoscopes, that's divination, folks. By participating in seances or psychic readings, whether in person or on phone or online. By using crystals or drinking potions as a means of protection uh, to gain power, spiritual power in this world. All these things are commonplace in our society. They are all associated in God's word with the kingdom of evil. 
And they are all things that so many, even in the church, dabble in. Repent. Turn away from it. And confess it. And, you, know, you know, we need to repent of these things because in addition to just outright defying God by doing these things, we sin that way. But, and also in doing these things, we're committing the sin of self-idolatry. Because when, when we participate in these things, we're setting ourselves up as God. Do you recognize that? Here's what goes on. People participate in witchcraft or seances or psychic readings or horoscopes, other such practices for two reasons. Truly only one, but, but two reasons. One, they try to gain power over the spiritual forces or over other people in this world. They want to be able to control things. Or two, because they think if they can have divine knowledge through these vices, they can then take steps to protect themselves from what would otherwise be the unknown. You see, it's all about control and power. That's what people want. But neither of those things belong to us. Control and power protection, they are ultimately God's dominion. God alone has authority to control what happens in his creation, and God alone is our protector. And by trying to seize these things, through, through even just dabbling in witchcraft or sorcery, we are seeking to bypass God. We are putting ourselves in the place of God, which is the oldest sin in the book. That's why Adam and Eve ate the fruit, so they could be like God. And here we are still doing it. We need to repent and confess. Finally, verse 19. A number who had practiced sorcery <clears throat> brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. Folks, there had been a lot of sorcery in Ephesus. We know that because many came and publicly burned their manuals for sorcery. And, and there were so many of these manuals that the value of those books alone was 50,000 drachmas. 50,000 drachmas. Can you believe it? 50,000. What the heck does that mean? Well, 50,000 drachmas. A drachma was a day's wages. So 50,000 equaled what it would take 150 men to make working for a whole year. Or, to put another way, that's what you would earn in those days if you worked every day, seven days a week, for 137 years. That's a lot of coin. A lot of money. So deep was their repentance that they burned it all. There's no going back now. We burned it. They would pay any cost to repent and be redeemed by Christ from the powers of darkness that had been in their lives. How do we respond? Again, the same way. As I've been talking, maybe you realize that, uh, hey, you, you do have things. You have books or things or other materials associated with sorcery and witchcraft. You might not have even realized it as an act of repentance. Get rid of them. Burn them. As with the Ephesians, there may be a monetary cost associated with that. You paid for that, and now you're out that money. But get rid of it and don't look back. Pay that cost in order to fully uh, experience the redemption of Christ. You like to see Christ redeems us fully. But so often we're holding on to things that keep us from experiencing the fullness of that redemption. But for most of us, let's be honest, the true cost of repenting in this way is relational. Isn't it? Some of these practices are so common in our society that people might not understand, they might laugh at us, might even ostracize us when we make the commitment to not having anything to do with those things. I'll come to this thing with me, or we're, we're going to this seance, or we're going to this, this psychic or whatever. I don't do that. Uh, you, you know, I, you know I, Jesus tells me not to do that. Oh, you're just a funny daddy. You're just one of those church people. You're no funny. You know, we get that, right? So it affects our friendships and our reputations. More than money. That's the cost we pay for having nothing to do with these deeds of darkness. That's the same as us burning our scrolls. But hey, closing, real fast. It all comes back to this. Holding Jesus in highest honor. Is Jesus higher to us than what we stand to lose by, doing, have, by having nothing to do with these things? Is Jesus higher to us than what we gain by participating in these things? See, when we put Jesus first, we overcome 
because greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Let us pray. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, it's kind of a different topic for us to come to today. And uh, we admit sometimes uh, we approach this topic with some fascination. And some of us approach it with fear, maybe some, some of both. But God, we, we look to you as our Redeemer, as our Savior, as our Protector, uh, as the one who, who rules over all of creation. As we look to these things, oh, we acknowledge uh, that uh, we have no power against them even though they're very real. But God, we, we know that you do, that you're the authority over all of it. And so we step back and we once more, we recommit ourselves to Jesus Christ and his authority, especially when it comes to these sorts of topics that we talk about today, God. Forgive us for times when we've uh, kind of put our foot in that ring and dabbled in them. Deliver us from any impacts that that might have brought into our lives and help us to just keep looking to you and turning to you as we go through this world, a world in which these things are real. Let's just keep holding you high above everything else. We look to you, Jesus, and you alone. Amen.